Welcome to this, I believe, first ever session at SOCAP on Childlands Investing. Um, it is a conversation and a presentation on our newly published Childlands Investing Framework. Please check it out if you haven't. Um, as Chris said, my name is Alexander Rustami. I lead the Innovative Financing Hub in Helsinki. It was a long trip to get here. Uh, and it's also a good moment to enjoy the sun because, yeah, in Helsinki, we're going to wait until April till we see the sun again, almost. With me, I have our fantastic youth ambassador, <laughs> Kripa Kanan. Um, and we're going to talk about childlands investing. Um, and we also have our esteemed panel, which is, they're going to come up on the stage a little bit later. But before we proceed, I want everyone to take a deep breath and imagine, imagine, picture a world in peace, a world with no poverty, with zero hunger, a world without pollution and climate change. Picture that. I think it's not a difficult task for you to do that because you're here. All of us want that. That's why we are here. But if you had one choice, one option, to realize that, to make it happen. One little tweak you can do so that in one or two generations, we have a world like that. What would that choice be? What would that little tweak be? For me, the answer is clear. That's why I joined UNICEF. I believe <clears throat> that in a world where where children, from the day they are born, if they receive and they are raised with love and care, they have all their basic needs met, they have all the opportunity to reach their highest potential. In a world like that, there will be humans which respect each other and they respect the environment they live in. I think that's the only way we can realize that dream which we all share. Children are our most precious resources or assets. Still, from the plenary yesterday was a lot of good discussion and a lot of good presentation, but children were not mentioned at all. Still, Children are our most important assets, but we don't talk about them, and we don't think about them as precious assets which we need to invest in and care about. But when we think about children, it's quite limited. We think education, yeah, we can invest in education, and that's it. But children are more than just few sectors or industries. Children are part of an ecosystem. It takes a whole community to raise a child, and investing in that same child are flips the community itself. So children are part of everything. So child lens investing is not only about education, but it's about all the ecosystem where children are part of. And it's also interoperable with all other impact themes. 
So child lens investing, if you do climate, if you do health, if you do education, the child lens investing framework can be added to that, and it's complementary to it. Uplifting children is not only the smart thing to do, it's the ultimate way of impact investing. We truly believe that. And we want you to join us. And we need to do it because we are failing children everywhere. One out of six live in extreme poverty. One out of six children. And one billion children on this planet lack access to life's necessities. That's a huge number. And we need to join forces. So when it comes to children and what they need, over to you, Kripa. Hi, thank you, Alexander. My name is Kripa. I'm a UNICEF USA National Youth Council member and advocate for climate change. And I just want to thank you all so much for coming to the session today and taking time out of your day to come listen to what we have to say. Today, October 24th, 2023, is a day filled with great concern. I'm concerned about the future. With our polluted atmosphere, dependence on fo fossil fuels, and lack of equitable solutions, the climate crisis is only worsening. When I visited India, I saw the large proportion of the population that was affected by climate change, from displaced housing and forced migration to immediate health effects like lung cancer, heat-related illnesses, respiratory problems, and waterborne diseases. And who is most affected by all of this? Children. Seeing firsthand the effect of environmental pollutants on well-being, I became a passionate climate justice advocate. But climate is only one piece of the puzzle. There are many other humanitarian issues that go hand in hand, like health, education, the effect of armed conflict on climate change, and water sanitation hygiene. I have organized citywide trash pickups and community-wide volunteering and awareness events, making blankets out of plastic bags to donate to homeless shelters, for example. I've been a club leader for numerous environmentally focused organizations, spoke at conferences like these, and done things just as small as planting trees and taking care of gardens at school events. However, while these events are impactful, it's not enough. It's simply not big enough to make the change that we are looking for. We need to be big and we need to be bold, and that starts today. Now I have a question for you all. All of you are currently driving investments and are actively contributing at the decision-making table. Do you know how many children you reach with your work? Do you know how these specific issues I mentioned before affect children directly? Do you have a well-established child or youth committee? Young people have the most at stake and their voices need to be heard. Despite being the most affected demographic, our voices and interests are underrepresented in decision-making, especially in the investment world. But imagine what we could accomplish if we tapped into the $12 trillion private capital market. This could encourage green investments, establish public-private partnerships that support infrastructure development, promote research and development of green technologies, and create climate finance literacy. It is critical to prioritize children and our needs, ensuring a better future for us all. Why is it that large companies are often a cause for climate change? Let's change that narrative. Instead of utilizing fossil fuels and transportation emissions, expanding production that directly causes deforestation, partaking in plastic pollution, and adopting high energy technology, let's make the private sector a partner in this fight for climate justice. Philanthropy alone isn't enough to ensure that every child is healthy, educated, protected, and respected. Investors have the unique power to shift capital and support the issues that matter to them and their actions, whether it directly or indirectly affects the lives of children. I hope you'll listen deeply in today's conversation. We must consider the next generation in investing. It's our only hope for a better future. Today, October 24th, 2023, is now a day filmed with, filled with change and hope because of you all. We need your help. Thank you.
Thank you, Kripa. Children are not consumers, they are not voters, they are not a workforce, and that's why they are not part of the equation. But we want to change that. We want all of you to embrace our call to action. Come and do research with us, advocacy, come and test, and come with us to build the field of child lens investing, because that is the next big thing which is going to happen within this space. Thank you. That, the panel, please. Welcome, everybody. You, you all in the back, that means you, Joy. Come on up. <laughs> Dimitri, you too. Come on, it's going to be more, it's going to be more cozy if you, if you move forward. Um, I'm David Bank. Whoops. I'm the editor and CEO of Impact Alpha. We uh, cover everything around the impact investing field. How many of you are readers of Impact Alpha? Nice. How many of you are subscribers to Impact Alpha? Thank you. Um, so uh, let's... Um, so let's just hold off on the introductions of the panel. Let's, a little bit of the of the room here. Um, oh no, let's do let's do the panel first, because um, uh, uh, then then they'll know who they'll know who they're talking to. So, um, Christina Shapiro from from UNICEF USA, just just tell us briefly who you are, who you are. Of course, hi. We'll get into hi the everyone. I'm Christina right Shapiro, now. UNICEF USA. I'm the president of the Impact Fund for Children, the uh, impact investing affiliate of UNICEF USA, and a core partner in launching child lens investing. Thank you. And, and Preeth Godar from uh, Save the Children Global Ventures. Yep. Save the Children Global Ventures is a new organization within Save the Children. You all might know that Save the Children is a, a humanitarian and international development organization. Global Ventures was set up to um, mobilize um, capital for children through impact investing and innovative finance. Um, and we are uh, looking to be um, kind of very intensive adopters of child lens investing. Terrific. And Caitlin Rosser from Calvert Impact. Yeah. Hi, everyone. It's great to be here today. Uh, Caitlin Rosser, I lead impact measurement and management at Calvert Impact. Calvert Impact is a nonprofit impact investing firm based here in the U.S. Uh, we raise capital from individual and institutional investors, pool it into a loan fund through the community investment note, and then lend it out to funds and financial intermediaries operating all around the world across nine different sectors and 100 different countries. Uh, so really excited for the conversation here today. Great. And now, who, who are you all? Um, first of all, how many of you once were children? <laughs> how many of you have children in your life in some way? Your own, your friends, your family, your community? And how many of you um, actively consider uh, children in your investment or other decisions? How many of you would like to learn how to actively consider women in your investment decisions? Uh, it's children in your investment decisions. All right, so that's the, that's, that's the setup um, here. And uh, Caitlin, you have uh, uh, spearheaded an effort to sort of formalize and, 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 and provide a framework for thinking about this. And just tell us how you've come to, to think about child lens investing. Sure, so thanks. Can everyone hear us? It's a little bit uh, cavernous in here, so if you can't, just let us know, and we'll speak louder. So we all... I think a lot of you, because a lot of you raised your hands, know that childhood is a uniquely formative age. And any investment in children, particularly in early childhood, um, have a disproportionate impact in the life of that child for the rest of their lives. So what we have been doing over the past year with our partners at the Office of Innovation at UNICEF, with Tideline, who's in the audience, and, and Criterion, who's also been a partner in this work, is to bring to life what it means to incorporate children into investment decisions. And that is simply because investors don't consider children as stakeholders. Children are ubiquitous, but they're invisible from investment decisions. And what the child lens does is it invites investors to put really their glasses on and look through the lens of a child, incorporate child-related factors into their investment strategies and processes, and with the goal of avoiding harm, but that's really a low, a low bar. It's, it's more than avoiding harm. It's driving improved uh, well-being for children and improved childhood outcomes. And the approach that we took was uh, to really pursue a principled approach 
to the development of a lens. And so that means bringing in key principles to this investing strategy. And so one of those core principles, which I think will resonate with a lot of you, is the, the, the principle of the whole child. And the reason that's really important is because children are not economic agents, they're often not considered as part of an investment strategy. But if you're an investor, you could be impacting a child by investing directly in the education, health, or nutrition of that child. If you're an investor that is investing in the families, um, it could be through small business lending um, that it, for heads of households or loans and mortgages, you are impacting that child. If you're investing at the society level on the systems that children need to succeed, the education, um, uh, the healthcare systems, you are impacting children. So by taking a whole child view, we invite investors to understand that they are having impacts on children. Every investor action, I think Kripa said it, um, impacts children directly or indirectly, intentionally or intentionally. So that is, that is the, one of the, the core elements. We're inviting investors to be intentional. So to be a child lens investor, because we don't want to dilute this. It's not everything is a child lens investor, so we're all child lens investors. There has to be intentionality, including specific elements of how you're pursuing better business practices or specific investments for outcomes in children as part of your ESG or your impact strategy. There has to be intentionality of incorporating children in your investment process and also in outlining what contribution you're having as an investor. And in doing so, what we've done is we've, we've really created a broad tent. We learned from the gender lens investment movement, which is we wanted to create a broad tent and allow many different kinds of investors with different strategies to see themselves reflected. So this particular lens invites investors in the public equity space to be child screening investors, which means they're screening in particular opportunities or actively managing investments to ensure that the companies that they're investing in have business practices that elevate child well-being and avoid harm. If you're an investor in the private capital impact space, but again, you're investing in affordable housing, children are not necessarily the direct beneficiary, but you are impacting children. So you can be a child-inclusive investor by pursuing those same strategies, it's thematic or lens-wide, but certainly understanding how you're impacting children, assessing that impact, or you might be a child-inclusive investor that has children as one of many discrete impact objectives. And of course, um, there's um, entities like Save the Children whose North Star is impact for children. So the lens is meant to be very broad. And maybe just to end um, where, where Kripa left off is, you know, why is this important? And if you think about climate, I heard Doreen from uh, Impact Investors Exchange talk about how women disproportionately bear the brunt of climate change. But children do, more so than anyone else in the world. 80% of children are impacted in some way or form by climate change. I, heard the statistic that 20,000 children have been displaced by climate-related activities every day over the last six years. Children are also disproportionately bearing the burden of, of energy insecurity. So imagine a, a world where a climate investor who's focused on renewable energy is not only focused on renewable energy, but is focused on that renewable energy in a way that impacts households, clinics, and schools, not only driving lower carbon emissions, but better health and education outcomes. That's the vision we want everyone in this room to walk away with. Terrific. And so, Preeth, let's dig in a little bit because you'd imagine that Save the Children would have already had a child lens investment, a, a child lens in some, in some fashion. So what actually is new or helpful or useful about this framework? It is, it's exactly what Christina said. It is introducing a new level of intentionality to what we do. Um, it is very easy to be Save the Children and deploy capital and just claim uh, impact for children, but we are looking to build the field a little bit and um, show that it's much more, um, impacting children is, is much more than just about saying you're doing it. It's about kind of intentionally demonstrating it and having a thought process uh, around it. Um, you know, we have a variety of investment tools. Um, that we're deploying in the marketplace. We have an early stage venture fund. We have a philanthropic fund. Um, we have another, a larger wholesale debt fund that we're trying to launch. Um, and we, so we have a number of investment strategies and we have actually a number of themes across which we can um, deploy capital for children. So education, health, agribusiness, uh, just a number of different ways that touch children. And you know, the problem with our space has been that children can be touched 
in so many ways. That, you know, that's generally a good thing. Children's impact can come through many different channels, uh, but at the same time, because so many dots connect to children, and they connect in so many different ways, there's so much kind of breadth, so much um, different varieties of impact for children, it's almost as if uh, children have been overlooked as an impact uh, theme. Um, and that is sad because children kind of have no voice to, uh, to kind of tackle that problem. You know, if you look at gender lens investing um, and what's happened there, you have a lot of women champions in financial services. So kind of from the inside out, they were able to champion more capital for women. But that does not exist uh, for children. And so taking uh, a more intentional approach, um, to demonstrating that intentional approach, having other people demonstrate that intentionality almost gives that voice that's, um, that's missing back to, uh, back to children. And so, um, you know, we're, we're trying to almost emulate what, um, you know, gender lens investing did for moving money uh, into uh, to, to women. People here know about the 2X uh, challenge. Um, you know, I used to work for an advisory firm before this, and we used to help, you know, impact investors raise capital. Uh, and we would always tell them, sign up for 2X, because a lot of investors like to see a gender focus. And so we would actually see impact investors uh, who wouldn't otherwise do it start thinking about deploying capital for women. Um, and so these sort of, um, you know, these demonstrations of intentionality, these kind of field building efforts, they do actually move money. Um, and through Save the Children's work, I think we're trying to demonstrate that this is a new thing, um, kind of, you know, in conjunction with UNICEF, in conjunction with people like Calvert, um, and to, you know, make sure children kind of get that voice that they deserve in the impact investing world and, and beyond. Let's, let's just stay with it for a second, because um, actually, in my trick question at the outset, I was going to say how many children are here, and if you notice, there's actually not very many, if, if any. So to your point that um, unlike gender lens or some other lenses, you're sort of acting a little bit as a proxy for something that's not here. And so that's an interesting um, aspect. So just, just dig in a little bit on, on maybe on your own portfolio of how, how you think about this in a, in a, in a way that, that goes deeper than just the obvious, as you said, about investments yeah. that might affect children. Yeah. You know, so we've been working with um, UNICEF over the past, UNICEF and Tideline, uh, our colleagues are here over the past few months on what exactly uh, it means to take, uh, you know, kind of a, a child, like an intensive child lens investing approach to making, uh, to making investments. Um, our version of that is to start with, you know, do no harm. Um, it's to say, you know, make sure that if we're making an agri agribusiness investment, there's no children, you know, in the, in the uh, kind of child labor in the supply chain. That would be kind of a, we have kind of a baseline look at do no harm, but then we quickly start looking at things like scale uh, and things like depth um, as well. So in terms of scale, we look at kind of, you know, in absolute numbers or proportional numbers, how many children are impacted. But then we also look at, um, you know, our vulnerable children uh, being uh, kind of touched, be, you know, either especially low income, children with disabilities, uh, marginalized races, refugees, et cetera, et cetera. You know, is there any systemic impact uh, in something? Is the urgency of the impact very important? Uh, is the duration of the impact uh, going to be, going to be you know, large? So we, we look at a lot of those things, and then we look at that in conjunction with scale. You know, if scale is not huge, but depth is great, we like that, or vice versa. Um, but then we quickly move to actual intentionality. Um, you know, when it comes to intentionality, uh, there's, you know, there's quite a bit we can process there, but you know, we're actually, we're looking at you know, companies that very specifically think about children as a customer segment, and that would be kind of a baseline version of intentionality, but then we're also hoping, and every now and then we come across companies that actually collect data from children, um, that actually process that in the design of their products and services, and that take intentionality to the next, uh, to the next level. Um, and so that's broadly how we think about every single investment we make across education, healthcare, agribusiness, and even now climate. Um, as well. The, the last thing we look at is whether Save the Children can kind of amplify some of that impact through the, you know, the, the resources we have around the world, but, um, you know, that kind of layout is broadly how we think about um, uh, kind of 
translating the intentionality that Christina was talking about into our investment processes. Terrific. And, and Caitlin, you're kind of at the other end of the spectrum, and I think if I understand from our earlier conversations, did not have a specifically child lens on Calvert's investments. I think you probably do have a gender lens and, and other things. So then take the same question. How, do you, how does the, having a child lens affect your, your, your actual work? Yeah, David, it's, it's a great question. It's a question that I have gotten all day yesterday. Uh, whenever, <laughs> whenever I mentioned this panel, um, uh, you know, right after, what, it, what does a child lens mean? What, is, what does that mean? I, I get, okay, so how is that relevant to Calvert Impact for, for folks who, you know, who know our, our work and our portfolio? Um, and it was not at all obvious when we were first approached. Um, to, to consider the child lens framework. Um, you know, we, we lend through funds and intermediaries. Uh, the, the largest portions of our portfolio go to affordable housing, microfinance, SME lending, renewable energy, and sustainable ag. The more obvious sectors like health and education are very, very small in our portfolio. For, for example, as of the last quarter, education, pure play education was 0.2% of our portfolio. So when we considered something like a, a looking at the child lens, you know, it was not at all obvious at first. Um, the, the connection came when our CEO, Jen Price, um, you know, learned about the framework because she's on the UNICEF USA Impact Fund for Children board um, and, and investing in children and for children is, is really close to her heart. Um, she brought the framework to our impact team and, you know, in a, in a very non-pushy, respectful way said, you know, could we consider something like this? Um, and because of the analogies, and Preet, the, the analogy to gender lens investing is really, really apt here, um, you know, a, a lens and, and Joy, you were really wonderful at a, a webinar we, we, you know, held with, with Tideline and, and everyone a few, a few weeks ago, um, defined lenses as centering a voice that has not been considered in the past. And that was what was so important to us when we you know, became champions of gender lens investing at this point you know, t uh, 10, 11 years ago. Um, and that's what really resonated when we really started to dig into the child lens framework, centering voices that we had never considered before. You know, children, we never really considered what is the impact on children. And we started to look and the impact on children in our portfolio is everywhere. Children really are ubiquitous. Um, you know, they are the, the beneficiaries of affordable housing. When you're in, you know, families are the beneficiaries of affordable housing. If you bring residential stability, you get educational and health outcomes. Um, if you're thinking about microfinance and small business, entrepreneurs are often entrepreneurs to support their families. If you think about renewable energy, why are we doing, why are we investing in renewable energy? Well, for, for cleaner air and, and a more healthy environment. Um, all for our future generations to continue to exist on this planet. Um, so for us, it was a really, really eye-opening exercise to understand that impact on children is, is everywhere in our portfolio. We just needed to start being more intentional about, about asking about it. Let's just, just stick with it, Caitlin. So at some level, and, and, and Christina said this, it, it, it risks being, you know, everything and therefore not, not, not focused. So just take it either in your, the nine different issue areas that, or, or focus areas that Calvert has, or even just in the investment process itself from, you know, sourcing and due diligence through reporting and, and, and management and whatnot. How does, how, what changes by looking at it this way? Yeah, absolutely. I think we're still figuring out exactly, if you think about the investment management process, we're, we're still figuring out how the child lens is going to be implemented across each of those stages. But because I'm the director of impact measurement and management, we started with impact measurement and, and impact <laughs> reporting. Um, so earlier this summer, um, you know, we, alongside Preeth, um, participated in a, a, a cohort of investors piloting this framework, um, you know, led by Tideline and, and UNICEF USA and, and the other UNICEF teams. Um, and we started it coincidentally was right at the time we were preparing for our annual impact data collection process. Um, so we collect um, impact data on an annual basis from our 100 portfolio partners, so 100 funds in the portfolio. We usually kick off in, in June. It's what we say, remember, it's impact reporting season. And you know we can go into uh, after, afterwards, I can walk through that whole process with folks. But it was a really appropriate time for us to say, OK, well, we, we think that this could be relevant. We've got a touch point with all of our portfolio partners coming up in a month. Let's just ask them, 
what are they already doing? And the results were so surprising. There were some sectors where the impact should have been more obvious um, to us be before we asked, and, and you know, kind of in hindsight, it, it is really obvious, affordable housing. Um, so for example, we had a portfolio partner uh, respond back to us, self-help enterprises. They are an affordable housing developer um, based in the San Joaquin Valley, actually of, of California. Um, and they came back with, to us and said, wow, we have so many you know, additional programs that we do for children, for the families when we're developing affordable housing. We are thinking about eco-friendly playgrounds, play spaces, you know, appliances. We're thinking about the materials that we're using in the building development, making sure that they are not, you know, they're non-toxic, that they're not harmful for children. They're so intentional about, you know, their, their housing design. Um, as another example, a microfinance network group, uh, Vision Fund International responded to us and, and said something similar. Children are centered in our work. Um, and in fact, they actually do a, a survey of all of their, or of a sample of their clients across all of their networks, trying to understand a set of what they call child well-being outcomes and how that changes over time the longer clients are clients of, of Vision Fund, of the particular you know, country, country group. Um, so that was surprising, but it shouldn't have been. Um, and I think that there's a couple of sectors that we're now going forward continuing to test the relevance of this, um, both in, I think, product design as well as in outcomes measurement, um, you know, on an, on an annual basis, and that's renewable energy. I mean, we, we often say, like, solar home systems allow students, allow children to study, <laughs> like, longer. They get to study after school. They get to do their homework. There's health outcomes there. There's educational outcomes there, um, and yet we don't actually ask about those <laughs> to many of our portfolio partners. Um, so that's an area we have to start exploring more. Um, and so, you know, really the, the, the sky is the limit in terms of, of how well we can understand our, our impact on children across all of our different sectors. It's just going to be about where do we start to, to focus going forward. Right. Preet, let's go back to you. And just um, imagine if folks wanted to... Um, start building a child lens portfolio, one place they might look is, is save the children's own portfolio. So give us just a couple examples and, and sort of pin down on how, how, how you've sort of centered uh, children in the, in the investments. Yeah, I'll, I'll provide a quick set of three or four different examples to just give you kind of, uh, you know, a variation of the different, the wide variety of flavors of impact for children. And again, kind of why, you know, a child lens is, is actually very useful. Um, you know, we're doing something ex as explicit as uh, trying to finance uh, early childhood development centers, you know, in kind of cruder terms, preschools um, in Rwanda and South Africa, uh, for example. We know that um, equipping preschools better will, um, first of all, will increase access uh, to preschools, but um, it'll also kind of, you know, retain children in preschools more, which leads to um, just kind of better learning outcomes, and we know that um, you know learning outcome changes in early childhood have kind of longer trajectories uh, on things. And we had to think about that. We had to apply a child lens um, uh, piece of thinking to make sure that we are um, making the connections in a way that that, that are meaningful. Um, but that's very, I mean, that's kind of um, a very obvious uh, example. You know, we've also done a lot of work in health investing. Um, and for example, we made a, an investment in a, um, in a diagnostics company, a machine learning based diagnostics company. They're actually here, they're called Think, ThinkMD. Um, and we, you know, we, we had to be thoughtful about what the connection was between um, a general healthcare company, a healthcare kind of tech company, and children. Um, and we saw that this company had the ability to work um, throughout Save the Children's programs around the world and equip healthcare workers um, to be more accurate in uh, their diagnoses of illnesses for children. And so um, there is an example where, you know, we're not talking about schools, preschools, where, you know, the impact is relatively obvious. We had to kind of define kind of what the connections were to children and how strong they were and what the intentionality of this, uh, this company was. In this particular case, it was strong because um, they had a very uh, explicit kind of pediatric component to it. And so the connections were, uh, were, were clear. But now, you know, we're also doing um, we're also doing other things. We're talking to a corporate partner um, about uh, trying to do outcomes-based financing for their supply chains, kind of providing more affordable financing 
for supply chains that don't use uh, child labor. Um, so now you're getting into a different flavor of thinking about children. Um, and you know, there we had, to, we had to think about, you know, is the do no harm piece enough uh, for us? And that's still a question that we're, uh, we're, you know, we're, we're trying to, to process through. Um, and, uh, and so again, I think we saw the use of why uh, a structured approach to, to child lens investing is important because we're also trying to prevent a little bit of children's impact washing. You know, the fact that we're maybe saying that hopefully, you know, means that child lens investing is, is on the map. Um, but, uh, but yes, I mean, it just, it just shows the needs for the tool. And then, you know, finally, we're thinking about climate investments. Um, and this is where I think we have to be the most thoughtful because it's very easy to say that any investment we make in climate benefits children, and so therefore, it's a, you know, it's a child lens investment. Um, but we're trying to, again, be a little bit more thoughtful about um, whether there is intentionality instead of just saying, you know, future generations are going to inherit uh, the future climate, we're trying to put a little bit more um, kind of focus, specificity, intentionality behind that. But um, as you can see kind of across, it, it's, you know, we have to apply this across venture style investments, across philanthropic investments, uh, across wholesale debt financing. We have thought about doing things like ETFs in public markets with a child lens. Um, and so uh, all, you know, all that, just shows how kind of badly something like this is needed and, and you know, just the fact that it doesn't exist at all now uh, and it's important to build. Great, great. Christina, just take it up a level then. Like, you think of UNICEF actually saved the children as well, more in services, advocacy. You don't necessarily think of UNICEF as an impact investor. I know you have a, a fund and, 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 and Preeth has a fund, but, but, why, but, but take it to the level of what can investors how can investors actually have an impact on, on children? Yeah, so, I mean, I think you've heard a lot of examples, but just uh, why UNICEF? I mean, we, ex UNICEF operates in 190 countries. It has 16,000 staff. It's already uh, making sure that every child is healthy, educated, protected, and respected. To add to that, UNICEF has a long trajectory of working with corporations to improve business practices through the child rights and business teams. So to us, it was a very natural extension as we're thinking about how do we address the significant gap in, in funding and financing available to achieve the SDGs to, to really fulfill our mission? I mean, to, to do what CRIP is asking us to do, what our other youth ambassadors and, and youth council members are asking us to do, we can't just think about philanthropy and government. We need to think about the full capital spectrum in the financial markets. And so our job right now is, is, is not so much as an investor. It doesn't mean that we can't in some point think about partnerships, but it's really to, to, to challenge the field to bring the youth voice, the youth lens. Um, thank you, um, uh, Caitlin, for that very effective definition of, of a lens. Um, and, and to really ensure that investors are incorporating children. So that's the, that's the why UNICEF. Um, the, the, as we thought about it, we, we wanted to make sure that w whatever we were creating was highly interoperable, right? So we know everybody is, um, you know, if you're focused on a thematic or you're already focused on a lens, the question we're getting is, are you asking us to do one other thing? And the answer is yes, but it works with what you're doing. We're, we're, we built, uh, you know, it, the intentionality that Tideline approached this was, was to make sure that this particular framework is ele elevating the best practices that already exist within the ESG and the impact space, right? So the, the operating principles of impact management, management the, the principles of responsible investment, the SDG impact standards, it is really built, it, built on top of those um, we even, part of the toolkit that was designed to accompany the framework is leveraging tools that are probably being used by a lot of investors already in this room. The difference is we're asking you to consider the impact on children, but the tools are similar. And we even went as far as starting a metrics bank of metrics that exist in the impact measurement standard, uh, uh, systems that you're all using. So we looked at Iris Plus and what metrics are there that uh, reflect impact on children that you could start to report on. So, so I think that's, that's the, the UNICEF role. Um, but, but to Preeth's point and to yours, I mean, we don't, it's not about uh, blue washing, it's really about the intentionality. And it's, for us, it's about investors beginning to make those connections and reflections on how are we impacting children, directly or indirectly, to try and understand and, and measure it um, because in order to better manage it and to be intentional, you have to be able to measure it. And you might be doing harm and not know it, 
but you might also be accomplishing significant impact that you're not elevating. And as I met with a lot of fund managers recently, I got asked, which is a fair point, like, is this gonna help me raise money? You know, my concern is I need to raise money, I already have an impact objective. The answer is yes, I think over time, absolutely. Um, but you need to elevate the data. If you're able to show that in addition to achieving a certain climate or energy objective, you're improving the outcome for children and families, I think that is incredibly appealing, not only to investors that are focused on children, but investors that are focused on impact. So let me pause there and, and see if you have another question. Well, the, the, the follow on that is, yes, you can elevate the impact. And the question that some folks will ask, and you know, they may get pushback about that, is there, are you also elevating returns? So the, mm. the business case question, yeah. which I know raises hackles sometimes, but um, is, it, it can be additive to the, to the argument. And maybe there's um, some indication, at least conceptually, if not yeah. in the data, that, that there's a, a, a business advantage here. So I, I will say there's, in the, in the public equity space, there is emerging uh, information. So I don't know if he's here, but uh, Matt Goodwin from uh, the Global Child Forum, um, which is a nonprofit funded by the, Re the Swedish royal family, um, they've created a benchmark. They've been tracking publicly traded companies, um, and they have been showing a correlation between performance on the index as it relates to a company's uh, performance on child rights and financial performance. So it is initial data that exists. I would say, you know, you have evidence every day. A, a healthier child is a more, is a better uh, student, is a better uh, worker, is a better leader. So there are evidence that if you are investing in children, it results in better economic growth over time. I mean, again, that is a macroeconomic argument, so maybe not what you're looking for. But part of the challenge is, because children are not economic agents, that data is not being reported, yeah. David. So that is part of what, when you think, what is UNICEF looking to do? is we need to field build, and all of you in the room need to help us do that. So that is elevating cases where you're seeing financial results improved because of a focus on children. I would argue that, and again, I don't have the data yet to prove it, but maybe some affordable housing investor does, is that if you are an affordable housing investor that is considering children, and you're focused on better proximity to childcare, uh, green foods, uh, educational facilities, that you're gonna have less turnover amongst your tenant base, which improves the financial performance of the project, while also achieving better outcomes for children. Great. You, you seem like you were wanting to weigh in on this? I, I mean, I can just quickly say uh, a couple of things. Um, you know, there are three levels of, of, of the case. Um, one is, as Christina was describing, kind of um, reflecting almost um, the fact that, I, I think there is data around um, the fact that ESG uh, investments do outperform uh, non-ESG investments uh, over time. And when you take a child lens to things like no kind of child labor in supply chains, um, I think that very much is kind of, you know, re reflected. It's, it's uh, you know, those are practices that I think are known to generally um, bolster financial performance. Um, there is also the economic case, like you said, and I think the economic case is, you know, tends to be quite clear in that uh, there are things like, you know, data saying that if children are, you know, stunted and wasted in a certain economies, there's a trend to see, you know, that shows those economies just generally tend to have lower uh, economic output. So that exists. And then there's the more direct case for um, some of the markets we operate in. Um, education financing is actually, there's a huge demand for it. There is a business case to go and do more lending as, you know, to schools and early childhood development centers and small businesses. So the, the cases exist on various different levels. I think Christina's right, like more, more data needs to come through to show that, but there is a lot of data that kind of already does exist as well. So maybe just to jump into your point, I mean, by not considering children, you're ignoring market segments that are growing. I'm not gonna speak to the profitability of those, but if you look at maternal child health market, growing, renewable energy, growing, ed tech, growing, all child relevant. So I think they'd be, investors would be ignoring opportunities. I would imagine that on the other side too, that investments that hurt children could become increasingly less uh, uh, even, even available. So for example, the, um, the, the court case that uh, was recently decided in Montana, um, where some youths sued for that the approval process for, for, for oil and gas and other energy projects and had to take, and the development projects in general had to take into account um, children's right to a healthy environment. I think there's a federal court case moving through the, the, on the same track. Um, uh, the, there might be drivers 
um, like that, or even uh, regulatory drivers that said you, you must take into account children, and if you couldn't, then you'd be disadvantaged. Well, we'd love to see even more of that. We were very encouraged by that case. Um, I know that there's other states that are going the other direction, but we're not going to focus on those. Um, but I definitely think that case in particular elevated the fact that you, a, a child's rights to clean air supersede somebody's rights to pollute. And I think that was very affirmative for our vision and, and the mission that we're pursuing. Um, uh, I think we, we're going to take questions um, from the audience. I don't know, how are we doing that? Are we taking, people have, you have notepads to write down or are we going to just um, take them live? Um, I guess we, people want to do it live. Um, uh, and we're at, uh, here we have, Chris, how do you want to do it? You want to, you want to collect them? All right. Oh, with a microphone. There you go. All right, so Crystal, Crystal, run around. Put your hands up again. You can choose, Chris. <laughs> Thank you. Um, what do you think of the childcare cliff in the US? I don't understand how that happened. The childcare cliff, where 3.2 million children are losing access to daycare because federal funding is expiring, it, it'll, it'll make a lot of working women have to quit their jobs in the US. The childcare industry also um, uh, disproportionately employs working women, sorry, disproportionately employs women. Um, so both in terms of the job loss from the women who will be impacted by the childcare daycare centers being um, losing funding, losing federal funding. Um, so the childcare cliff deadline was September 30th. I've been following the Moms First and the Marshall Plan, um, the Moms First posts, and um, I'd love to know your thoughts on the childcare cliff and what uh, you guys are, like what your um, organizations are planning on doing to support children and mothers who will probably have to step back from the workforce to be able to take care of their children, but will lose their jobs. I, I, you know, I can take, uh, it doesn't answer your question directly. We're, we're not directly working in the U.S. at this moment, um, but the strategy that we talked about, we're actually trying to scale up in a bigger way in different countries. So, you know, I mentioned kind of this one transaction around um, financing early childhood development centers in, in South Africa and Rwanda. We're actually now trying to commercialize that and make a, a large fund, um, you know, a sizable fund, um, you know, at, something in the range of 50 to 100 million dollars to do that around the world, um, starting primarily in Africa, but in other places as well. Um, and the importance of this uh, actually relates to something else that we didn't cover uh, before, which is the cross-section of child lens investing with other types of, of lenses. Um, with this particular example that you're talking about, I think child lens investing is super interesting because making a child lens investment also contributes to gender lens investing because it actually supports the care economy as well. I mean, it allows women to participate in the workforce. Um, of course, uh, it affects girls uh, in schools and kind of girls' education as well, while generally being very intentional about uh, investing in, in, in children. So we think, and with all of this, going back to the last question David asked, we think there's actually a strong business case to do this. We can actually deliver financial returns um, if we go to you know, certain market segments, certain regions, certain places, while still hitting uh, underserved populations. So the business case exists, and not, not only do you kind of get a good child lens investment, but you actually are touching other, other lenses uh, as well. So we think this exact space is ripe for greater investment, and we're going to make a big play uh, on it soon. Um, keep, keep them coming. Hello, um, and thank you for giving me the opportunity. I am Shan. I'm from Trinidad and Tobago, so I'm in the Caribbean region, and also a SOCAP entrepreneur whose business model actively incorporates children, specifically in the wash space. So I work in waste management. Um, and getting the children to, one, understand the importance of managing their waste and how it affects them and how they live, um, and also doing that through really creative storytelling. I'm also a children's book author um, and created stories for them to understand the importance. So my question is, 
the Caribbean region has often been uh, ignored for a for long time as it pertains to investing. However, because we're all island communities and significantly impacted by the events of climate change, one of our islands was completely wiped out, which hasn't happened in over 150 years. It is important that we uh, show that investment can come to the Caribbean region. So my question for you is, one, have you ever considered uh, the Caribbean region as a possible area of choice for child lens investing? And two, how can entrepreneurs like myself, social entrepreneurs like myself, be able to access the funds that you have to increase our reach and impact with our work with children? Thank you. So there's a, there's a sort of interesting question embedded in that, which is people who have child lens, entrepreneurs who have child lens ventures, how can they get into kind of a, a, a pipeline for investors who are looking for child lens investing? And then the specific question about the Caribbean. Yeah, happy to, happy to take touch on this a, a little bit. You know, as a, a, essentially we're a debt fund to fund, so we're not lending directly to operating companies or anything like that. Although I, I really appreciate the analogy because we had a, a recycling company in our portfolio that we recently released a case study on, and we did not at all focus on their impact on children and that success story. And I, I wish we could kind of go back and, and re-interview the borrower. And I'm looking at my colleague, Catherine, who heads our portfolio, and we've worked on that case study for quite a long time. Um, and I know that Eureka Recycling is the company based in, in the Twin Cities here uh, in the States. I know that they, they incorporate children into their thesis as well. Um, so our, you know, I, I can't speak to necessarily how you can get capital you know, from, from impact investors who are investing in the Caribbean, you know, but I can certainly speak to the investments that we're making that do touch the Caribbean. Um, and so, you know, we have some investments through mostly kind of um, geographically diverse funds. So we're not kind of investing in, in one particular country or one particular country fund. However, there are a couple, um, uh, there's at least one fund that's coming to mind, and I'm not entirely sure if this would kind of, if, if you would fit in their, their investment um, strategy or anything like that. But we have a, a, a loan to a Crescent. Um, they are an SME financier in, um, in, based in Puerto Rico but they are now part of a, of a group called Cygnus Capital. And Cygnus Capital wants to become the premier Caribbean investment, impact investment fund. They're based, they're based out of Jamaica, but they do investments all across the Caribbean. Um, and this was just a, a really helpful uh, push for me to start asking a little bit more um, about how their investments impact children. Um, for, so I just, a little bit of gratitude from me. <laughs> and you can just come and talk to us and talk about your business and <laughs> let's hear it. Um, we, we do have uh, one pool of money that can that could potentially look at this. As further advice, there's a group called Incofin. They launched a wash fund, a global wash fund. I think uh, the Caribbean uh, might be part of that. The president uh, reached out after the Global Impact Investing Network and said, hey, I heard you guys are doing something around child lens investing. What is that? Um, you know, we'd like to learn more. This is the president of Inco Incofin, kind of a relatively large fund manager in impact investing. Um, so he's interested in this. If you have something for him, I can help connect to you. We can talk, uh, we can talk afterwards. Yeah. Hands? In, the, in front here? Thank you. Well, first, thank you for making space for this conversation and for your inspiration and the two of you too. Uh, my name is Ana Maria Aristizabal. I'm launching the first EdTech fund in LATAM, so I'm already early adopter and hope we can keep the conversation going. But one of the things I am doing a lot is like with entrepreneurs like you, is I'm actually educating them on frameworks and things that they need to be following and like I suggest that they do. So one is for them, like what are tools are available for them to embrace some of the frameworks that you are uh, promoting. And the second is I'm connecting with a lot of LPs, like family offices and like endowments and others who are like learning about some of these practices. So like maybe what's the strategy for you all to communi on com communications and advocacy and how we can all who are in this room and care about this support the effort. So maybe the question is how LPs can help for, uh, dr drive the conversation forward? So I'm going to broaden a little bit and then dive back in. So I think Part of our vision right now to ensure that there's awareness is doing things like this. I mean, we're at the GIN, we're at SOCAP, we are, you know, we're just recently publishing this framework and we're trying to get it out. Um, tomorrow there's a delegate-led session. Um, I, I see Joy here that 
all of us are participating in, and we invite you to come there because part of what we're trying to do is understand what people are doing in the child lens investing space already, where there's a gap in knowledge, and what we need to address. So I would say that right now we're trying to get the word out. Um, we're inviting people to do one-on-one -on -one meetings with us and to give us feedback to understand um, where are the gaps. So if you're interested in adopting this framework, but there are certain things that are getting in your way, what are those things? Um, what do you need from, from us or from other people in the field to be able to pursue this? So I would just say we're in the reflection mode and we invite everyone in this room to think about their impact and reach out. But um, we're going to continue to do this work and to case make, to elevate the case studies of the, the fund managers that participated in the cohort with Tideline, to elevate how a variety of different fund managers are already thinking about child lens in different ways, even when they're not exclusively focused on children. So that's something that we're committing to do in this space. Um, I think as, as LPs, again, you can bring in the perspective of, is this, is this, you know, this is something I care about. This is something I would want to track, I want to uh, begin to track. Um, you can begin to, 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 to share that awareness with other LPs. But I do understand if you're the sole LP in a fund, sometimes it can be hard to gain traction. So it's really about also educating the GPs too um, as a way to drive the change in the creation of new funds or the incorporation of uh, child lens into existing funds. Caitlin, you're, and, sorry, Preet. Caitlin, you, you're essentially a fund of funds, so you're a, an, an LP to those funds. And so how, what's your experience sort of introducing this to the funds in, in, in Calvert's portfolio? Yeah, absolutely. So we are, we are an LP in, in some funds, a limited portion of our portfolio, and the rest are, you know, it's the loans, balance sheet debt, that Got sort it. of thing. Okay. But, but still, I mean, the, the analogy is, is still there. Um, and I would just say, just start asking questions like we did. You know, really understand that you are not the expert. You are not the ones, you know, deploying capital on the ground. You're not working with the entrepreneurs but you are the ones who are going to these sorts of events and you're hearing, oh wow, this is something that investors are really starting to care about. And, uh, and oftentimes, we might be the first person to ask a, a GP or a fund manager or a borrower the question, but we are never the, 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 the only one. Um, we might be a little bit early, um, but then we prepare some of our GPs, some of our fund managers, some of our borrowers to get those questions kind of on, on the longer term. And frankly, I mean, I was very surprised at the positive responses that we got from, you know, uh, let's say 20, 20 funds when we asked, um, you know, our entire 100 fund portfolio over the summer, who is already considering children? If we had never thought to ask the question, we'd be missing out on a huge piece of the impact that our capital is helping to affect. Um, so, you know, just come to it with humility and just start asking questions. Can I, can I add? I'll say one more thing. Um, we have been uh, trying to promote child lens investing by just through our fundraising work. So now when we are going to LPs and pitching, we're saying, yeah, yeah, you know, in, in addition to this great investment strategy and this track record and all of those sort of things, we have this thing called child lens investing. And everyone, well, not everyone, but a large majority of people are very, very curious about what this is. Um, we've gone to DFIs. They really like it. They're like, tell us more. Sometimes they ignore a lot of the other stuff that we have in the deck, and they're like, tell us more about this child lens investing thing. Foundations really like it. And even some family offices um, where, you know, kind of, children's impact very much resonates with them. They like it a lot. So use it as a marketing tool. It is not high cost to do this. It is not extremely expensive. It's not difficult in any way. Uh, as long, I mean, you're working in ed tech fund, right? It should actually be quite straightforward and easy for you. And I think you will get a very good response uh, in the market. Like I was saying earlier, when I was um, working to advise funds on fundraising, uh, we told them always sign up for 2x. Um, I think, hopefully one day, child lens investing will start reaching that kind of place where you need 2x and you need child lens investing to really kind of, you know, attract investors. So let, let's see if we get, how fast we get there. That's a, that's a good jumping off point because I, I was going to do a cold call, um, and this is why people don't sit in the front row, Joy, but... Um, <laughs> But um, the, 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 the analogy of gender lens investing has come up several times. Joy was one of the pioneers of that lens, and I wonder whether you want have some thoughts on just how lenses develop and what the stages of, of sort of market, market formation are um, as people start thinking in a new way. Chris, you got a mic here? Okay, I'm here. What? Uh, okay, okay, let's hold. Okay, Joy, you got a minute to think about it? What? Yeah. 
think. Okay, back here. All right. So, thank you so much for you know creating the space for us to discuss about child lens investing. My name is Claire Ugoike, and I work with the American Heart Association. And um, part of what we do is um, we 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 have a social impact fund as you know in addition to the public health programs that we actually implement. Um, for the social impact funds, we work with over a hundred community-based organizations where we invest in them to address social determinants of health. And so part of their solutions are basically focused on children. Um, we do like education, solutions around education, access to healthy food, um, you know, health, and, and all that. So I'm wondering, um, what kind of metrics would you suggest, like, you know, when you're looking at child lens investing, how do you measure that? How do you, what are frameworks for measuring such, um, you know, kind of investment? So me measurement, it sounds like a Caitlin question. Yeah, happy, happy <laughs> to take that one. Um, I mean, I, I hate that like all of my responses, not in this panel, but in life are generally, are, it, it depends and it depends on the sector. Um, and health is not a, a huge portion of our portfolio, so I, I can't kind of f think through some of the some of the health specific metrics that you might you might think of but like Christina said you know they're building this this impact metrics uh, bank of existing impact metrics so kind of sourcing from the existing metrics um, that are out there and I mean really like if you think about the five dimensions of impact what who how much you know impact risk and, and contribution this is just another who that we haven't thought of we're not coming up with brand new metrics. These are just the, the same metrics that we're collecting if you're, if you're measuring health outcomes. This is just measuring the same health outcomes for children. I mean, there might, there's probably certain um, sectors, particularly education, where the metrics do change. So kind of you know, take what I'm saying with a grain of salt. But it's really, it's, it's less about completely changing our measurement approach and more about centering a stakeholder that has not been a consideration in the past. Um, so, so hopefully that helps a little bit. Do you have anything to add to that? I mean, we'll, we'll publish, um, the, the framework is out, the toolkit will be published um, on our website hopefully by the end of this week and with it will be a link to the metrics bank, so we encourage you to look at that. And I love what Caitlin said, it's about the who. Now, because we are asking investors to also consider the impact on indirect beneficiaries, investors might be um, already tracking impacts or, uh, sorry, outputs and outcomes for their primary target. So again, if it's about um, affordable housing, it's number of housing units on the market that are now affordable, number of, 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 of housing units that have more than two or three rooms, which are typically for families. But we are asking investors to track additional metrics that are available. Again, they're not new metrics, but if possible, how many newly housed children as a result of those housing entities. So this is an example of um, an extension of existing metrics, um, but moving beyond just the direct beneficiaries to indirect beneficiaries, which we know are children, but are not getting um, counted or measured. Great. Joy, you got, some, you, you got a few minutes of prep time now. <laughs> I'm not sure it is. When he does it, it works. Um, so Joy Anderson, Criterion Institute, um, and we've been we've been alongside UNICEF and and others in thinking through what would a child lens investment look like. And just just I had actually a question back to you because I one is I think the what you've reinforced so well and what we learned in gender lens investing is it's important to continue to say. We're not creating a new reality. We're not suddenly saying there's this thing that you're going to create. Children already exist. They are already affected by our portfolios. It's not like a new thing that we're making up. It's already there. The question is whether or not you have a clear lens to see it. Um, and, and I think that's where you know, people get confused. Oh my gosh, there's going to be more than one lens. We have to think about race and gender, and children, and like, well, like, yes! You, you really should be thinking about all of those things at the same time without your head exploding. So, um, but I think that's there. So my, my actually, I had actually raised my hand to ask a question, David, before you called me out. But, um, because one of the things we learned in gender lens investing, where I think we went wrong early on, 
is all of our early convenings around gender lens investing didn't actually include very many gender experts. Honestly, it was created by people who were responding to investor needs that were you know, you know, talking about investment opportunities, looking at the data case, and it was all really, in, I mean, good work. And building the traction and all of that, but so maybe one of my questions is, many of you named the sort of expertise about how to look, and, and UNICEF has this in spades, right? Sort of, how do you look at, um, in having a lens, how do we make sure it's a smart lens that actually is drawing from child rights organizations, the, the people who have been, you know, save the children, people who have been looking at children's issues for a long time, how do we make sure that that depth doesn't get lost in this new movement? Because I, I think it's one of, we were underwhelming in gender lens investing. We sort of got focused on women on boards and didn't have a, a deeper, more robust story. And so it's I think this is going in a different direction, but I'm curious about that. And I'll also just reinforce Christina's point. We are doing tomorrow a session in the morning that really is just what we used to do for the gender lens investing breakfast here that are like, everybody come together and talk about what you're doing to build the field of child lens investing. So that will be tomorrow and not a panel, just a whole bunch of people talking, but that's my question to you. All right, so if you can craft your answer to sort of how to be smarter and what's next and make it a closing statement, then you get extra points. <laughs> oh, I, I always wanted the extra points, so I'm, I'm going to do my best here. Uh, sorry, it's the nerd in me. Um, it's a really good question, Joy, and I think that is why um, we, we wanted, if, we felt very strongly that UNICEF had to be at the table as a convener, but obviously not the only voice in the room, and that's because we do have deep programmatic expertise, not the only one, clearly, on what has worked for children across different thematic uh, areas of investment and different geographies. And so certainly in development of this framework, we socialize this extensively within UNICEF, within our different divisions, our social policy team, our different program divisions, uh, et cetera, our child rights and business teams to get their input. And so that framework is reflective of that expertise. Um, in terms of what's next, I, I mentioned that we're asking people to, to very much reflect. Um, we think that one of the things that we've heard is an opportunity, not just a need, an opportunity to take this incredible framework that is at a high level and deepen it. Go one layer deeper into thematic areas where truly that expertise that UNICEF has will come to life. So, in the, you know, what is, and I often hear my, Colin, uh, my colleague Aaron saying this, well, what's the difference between a WASH fund and a WASH child lens investing fund? We need to bring that to life. What are the particular outputs and outcomes that we know are hugely important in the WASH space? And by the way, they may vary by geographies, but my guess is they may not. And then bring that to life. We're not going to be certifying funds, but we can certainly bring that knowledge through a deeper development of thematic guides. So that is definitely something that we're already in conversations on and thinking about. And then my closing statement. I leave you with this vision, right? Today, we always hear this rally call for net zero. And, and some of you said it before, but what if the rally call is no poverty, half of child poverty? That needs to be the rally cry by all private sector investors, not just philanthropists and governments. Yeah, uh, my, my answer will be less sophisticated to, I mean, Joy's uh, uh, question, just, you know, copy as much as possible. Don't try to reinvent. I mean, UNICEF has done all sorts of great work. We have, um, you know, our own kind of version that builds off that, but tries to take it a little bit further. So just, you know, the EdTech Fund here, the Global Alliance on Improved Nutrition has a, I mean, they're a joy. To your, to your point, many fund managers are already doing child lens investing. They're just not talking about it. So I think um, for, the, for those people who want to join in, just kind of use what's out there and then start talking about it more. Um, the community of impact investors in this room, I mean, if they just simply decided to adopt child lens investing, we already have a force, uh, a force that can go to kind of broader markets and take this to a new level. Uh, and so some of this is just about coming together as a community and saying, let's give voice to children, because in this community, children don't really have a voice. 
Uh, so all we have to do is take a few easy steps to adopt this, and we're already kind of like halfway through this battle. So um, talk to every impact investment fund manager on this campus about child lens investing. And Roberta, you have to get in on the game too, as well. Global Alliance for Improved Nutrition. I mean, obviously, pl plus one to, to what Christina and Preet said. Um, I will, you know, I think there's, there's two kind of angles that I'd like to, to take here um, in, in terms of like who, who's an expert as well. So obviously looking at the, the research and relying on like the, the programmatic experts like UNICEF and, and Save the Children, it's one of the, the reasons we were so um, comfortable but also excited to engage with, with this framework. Um, but in our portfolio, the experts are the fund managers. That's who we ask. Of, of course, the research is important, the academics are, are important, and it's important to, to test our assumptions against what the research said, it says is likely to happen. Um, but we put a lot of, of faith, a lot of weight into our fund manager's experience on the ground and then the entrepreneur's experience on the ground as well. Um, and so how can we, and I'd, I'd love to like leave folks with this, you know, how can we elevate the community voice and children's voices here um, you know, whether it's through, whether it's through surveys, whether it's through asking their parents, and I know there's all, all sorts of complications we can get into after the panel about <laughs> what parents might say versus what children might say. Um, but how, how can we go direct and, and really understand what children think about the impact that we're creating for them? How do we, how do we elevate community voice? Um, and then I guess, you know, one just kind of parting thought, um, I've said it before, but I'll say it again, just start asking questions. If you are a fund manager, start asking your portfolio companies. If you're an LP, start asking your GPs. Um, just start asking questions about how this might be relevant to, to the fund, to the portfolio company, to the entrepreneur, to the small business, to their family. Um, and I think folks will be just really, really surprised at the positive response that they'll get. Terrific. So ask questions, um, uh, socialize in the, in the impact world and, uh, and, and poverty and child poverty. <laughs>